agree. Yeah, everyone, we'll get started then. Oh, fantastic. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Bienvenue, Ani Boujou, Kinaweya. Uh, welcome to our FishCast annual general meeting, and we're so excited to have you all join us. Uh, I just want to introduce myself. Uh, we actually have some new FishCast trainees on, on with us today, and we've got some folk that are from our partners. And so in case you haven't met me personally, I'm Christina Semenyuk, you can call me Tina. I'm the director of FishCast and I'm an associate professor here at the University of Windsor. I am joined by our amazing admin support team, uh, Dr. Catherine Fabria. She's an assistant professor here at the University of Windsor. and She's the associate director of FishCast. We also have Dr. Christine Madgelger. She's our FishCast postdoc. And amazingly good news, she's soon to be an assistant professor at Algoma University. So congratulations to Christine. We're so excited for you. Congratulations, I think it's amazing. Um, and of course, we're joined by uh, Kendra Thompson Kumar, our program coordinator and you probably know her the best of everyone <laughs> out of all of us because she really is I think the heart of FishCast and keeping us together as a hub. I don't know if Katrina is joining us she's uh, having her house delivered and she's got some construction workers but we've got Katrina Kishik as well and she's our indigenous uh, knowledge coordinator program coordinator, coordinator of FishCast. So Welcome everyone and again just as a bit of a primer before I go into my presentation I'm looking outside the window right now. I'm at the University of Windsor. FishCast is primarily administered by the University of Windsor, and I'm enjoying this beautiful, cool autumn day where we're in a place of high biodiversity and yet high crisis uh, as well. And I just, I'm so grateful and I feel privileged to be able to gather here on the traditional territory of the of the um, Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, which include the Odawa, the Ojibwe, and the Potawatomi. Um, at this point, FishCast, we're a large community. We span uh, three provinces with universities from our faculty PIs, and yet our research is spread across from coast to coast, from British Columbia to Nova Scotia. And so we want to acknowledge collectively that our universities, our organizations, and our research, we all benefit from, and we're situated on the traditional and unceded territories and lands of Indigenous nations. And so collectively, we acknowledge the rights of the First Nations, the Métis, and the Inuit people of Turtle Island. I just gave a standard boilerplate uh, land acknowledgement that we try to move beyond more and more as we should and to try to enter more into these meaningful partnership and relationship buildings that acknowledge, acknowledge the history to the relationships to and the connection to the land on which we're all situated, no matter where we're calling in from today. As a community fish cast, um, we're primed, we're ready, and we're keen to try to work towards a, a more decolonial approach to our work. We wanna be able to grow capacity and our ability to address systemic barriers in our fields, especially in the fisheries and aquatic sciences sectors where there is a huge underrepresentation problem. And we wanna work with everyone collaboratively to overcome them. And I think fish cast as, I think we're well poised to do that I am eager to work with all of you to continue doing this, making this our mission, and um, to try to see where, where we come out at the end of this, at the end of six years. After all, uh, we are all treaty land inhabitants. This is our shared history, and this is also our shared future. So welcome all. Kinawea, viva nous tout le monde. And I'm, what I wanted to start with is see how my um, technical skills go into sharing a presentation. And so if you bear with me, I appreciate it. Guidelines. Oh, thank you. And Kat, let me know that she just posted the community um, guidelines in terms of um, code of conduct on our uh, on our AGM today. If you don't, if you can spare a couple of seconds just to have a, a read through that, that'd be amazing. And I'm going to just start um, by basically welcoming you again to celebrate the FishCast community together. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, what is FishCast? FishCast is actually a clever acronym that does really work out, but it works out in, in a, a roundabout way to be fisheries management and conservation careers in science and technology. This is a six-year grant from NSERC. It's called an NSERC CREATE grant. CREATE stands for Collaborative Research and Training Experience. It's funded for six years. We got our money in 2020. We've got a one-year cost extension. No cost extension, I wish. No cost extension. But what this money is meant to do is to help to support graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and to another, a lesser extent, undergraduates, 
in becoming the next generation of scientists in Canada or wherever else they may work in the world. And so the funding that they give us is to provide the majority of it to help support student salaries. But it's more than that, really. NSERC uh, and FishCast is a co-curricular program to train graduate students. So what that means is that our graduate students, they do their research, but they're doing their research with partners, partners that are affiliated with all the different um, faculty members that are a part of the CREATE grant, and some of which are on our call today. So we're so grateful to see you here. And so students do their research, they're involved in their internships with their partners. Their partners are ones who have been networked with our collective PIs for many years with them established relationships. And it's meant to basically learn experience, gain experience in their internships to be able to take it further. And again, make them marketable in their future, whatever future career that they have. Um, I'll talk more about that in, in a little bit, but Surprisingly, this is the first CREATE, to my knowledge, and there might be those who might, might have changed since then, but when it was awarded two years ago, it was the first one that centered on Canada's freshwater systems. And you might be thinking, okay, why did it take so long? Why now? And I think Canada finally recognized the economic importance of the freshwater fishery sectors. They, uh, Canada's recognized the increase in demand for healthy food and obviously recognizing the ongoing loss of freshwater aquatic biodiversity. And so as a consequence, Canada has been putting in at the federal level, at the government and uh, provincial level, a bunch of new initiatives, um, whether or not it's, uh, let's say a Genome Canada grant, whether or not it's a Habitat Stewardship Fund, whether or not it's the Canada Nature Fund. And they've put in all these in innovative programs to support this research, to be able to address aquatic freshwater species at risk, to be able to restore Canadian freshwater research with the experimental lakes area coming back online to help ensure the health of our fish stocks, as well as incorporating, again, um, habitat is a really key determinant into how healthy our fisheries and our freshwater fish ecology really is. And lastly, there's this recognition that we should be potentially doubling aquaculture production in the next decade to, to meet the protein needs of humans. All of this together, though, will require and need trained professionals and scientists. So we're well connected and with our network and our partnerships. And so this is really the strength of our the PIs, so the faculty members that are on FishCast, as well as the strength that we have with our partners. Because when this grant was being written, and I have to take my hat off to Dr. Daniel Heath, as well as Sarah Jameson, the late Sarah Jameson, who really was at the center of initiating this all before he turned the reins over, over to me. And uh, But again, so thank you, Daniel, and to Sarah. And the connections that we had with our partners showed us that our partners are potential employers of our trainees, of our students, and they want, they want more. Yes, you're gonna come out with your amazing graduate degree, learning your research and all that you had to do about it, but employers are looking to have students or potential future employees, um, to, and I'll set them aside, I'll set them apart and ahead of the pack. What's gonna distinguish them as potential employees? They want more. For example, they want, um, future employees to have a broad understanding of the policy and regulatory issues that you know, we're facing in our freshwater fishery sectors. They want them to have an understanding and perhaps even um, more than a basic uh, acquaintance with novel technologies for monitoring and health assessment. And they're increasingly recognizing the importance of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee of Canada saying yes, you know, it's not just a, a legal right, it's also a moral responsibility to help capacity build for co-producing initiatives with Indigenous communities. And as a consequence, FishCast listened. So um, all of us collectively developed FishCast in the direct response to the needs of the potential employers in the freshwater fish conservation and fishery sectors. And our goal really is this career preparation that's tailored for every student. And the trainees that are already on this, we know how much we ask from you. We are aware of that. You um, attend seminars, you attend our micro-credentials, you attend the meetings of the conferences, you are initiating partnerships with your internships that go above and beyond just collecting and analyzing data. And that collectively will help shape and mold, hopefully, for you to be the next generation of top tier experts in your field. When we were writing FishCast Grant, um, we got some good feedback at the letter of intent stage. 
we got some feedback at the end where they were really they were really impressed with what we had recommended in terms of, of addressing justice, equity, diversity, inclusivity, and indigeneity issues. Because you know, collectively, we all kind of share the same values in, in that diversity in thought. We respect differences in ways of knowing, doing, and being. And so they were impressed that we were attempting to at least acknowledge that we're trying to normalize inclusivity and collaboration across all aspects of the program. So from our in, intake application, we ask what your Jedi, the trainees, what their Jedi experiences are, what their knowledge is. Through our micro-credentials, we're attempting to address um, breaking down these systemic barriers. Through our events and our conferences, through our one-on-ones, we're really we're trying to, to move the field forward. We're definitely not there yet. We're having some stumbling blocks, but it's something that we're pursuing and going forward. And hopefully we're going to try to set the precedence for, let's say, Western science um, and how we deal more with recognizing, incorporating, and co-producing these um, diverse multiple ways of knowing. So that's just a brief introduction to, to FishCast. If you want more information on this, we have a YouTube channel set up by Kendra. Thank you, Kendra, where our seminar series are there. And so the first talk of the seminar series was going to more detail about what FishCast is. But again, just email us. We're more than happy to answer any questions you may have. So in terms of giving an update on, okay, this is what our plans were when we first started the grant. Where are we two years in? And I think the best way to, to describe it is by going over how we're structured. So we do have a top-down kind of structure on how FishCast is run that is supported by our faculty members, our partners, as well as our trainees. So we've got the program committee. We've got the recruitment, mobility, EDI, and I committee, shorthand, remedic, I call it. We have then the operations committee and the curriculum committee. And let me just go through each one with little updates so it's nicely paired together. And so welcome, this is the, who runs our program committee, which is like the oversight committee. They're the ones that um, help guide us. We have discussions on where to take fish casts in the next couple of years. They approve any kind of changes we make to the program. They oversee our budget because we have to spend our money and we have to spend our money the right way or else we're in big trouble with NSERC. So this is our oversight. So our chair is Heather Pratt. She is the executive director of the Office of Research and Innovative Services at the University of Windsor. Hi, Heather's here today. I wanted to thank Heather. I want to thank Margaret, Daniel, Brian, Courtney, Albana, and Andrew for being amazing members on our uh, program committee. They really do um, contribute and offer really, really good ways to make sure that we're keeping to our, our ideals and what we set out for FishCast since the beginning. Kendra put together a quick breakdown of our budget. Again, to show you in year one, year two, year three, the most important thing NSERC looks for is are we supporting stupid student stipends? And we have to have at least 75% of the money they give us go towards supporting um, the salaries of our trainees. And you can see in blue, we've been hitting our targets every single year. And that, you know, as we're entering in year three, we are actually, our budget is accounted for. And I'll show you the breakdown of how many students we have coming up too. You see here that um, in breakdown of year two and year three, you're like, well, the blue doesn't seem like that 75%, but take into account that we have indigenous student stipends. So um, we collectively decided and agreed upon to set aside some of our funds to fund indigenous scholars into our program. So the blue plus the orange is what you're seeing right there for year two and year three, and it's fully subscribed right now. And uh, we had mentioned amongst our, our community that if we, if it wasn't subscribed, we would still have that dedicated scholarship for other underrepresented groups within the fisheries and aquatic science sector. So um, we're basically, we're hitting our targets in terms of uh, the salaries that our students are getting were filled up. We have amazing uh, trainees that are in our program right now. But we also tried to use this opportunity and training of, uh, of this program to see if we could leverage it for additional types of funding to increase the scholarship that we're doing in FishCast. And so we were lucky enough in 2022 to be awarded the U Windsor Diversity, Indigenous and Anti-Racism Professional Development Fund for our proposal called Casting a Wide Net, 
quantifying the impact of decolonized networking practices and fish casts. So what this means is that we're, um, we're putting into motion and we're putting into place um, further scholarship on whether or not are we really adhering to the principles we set out with fish cats in terms of training and increasing the knowledge amongst our trainees about Jedi issues, their own personal journeys, uh, their, their knowledge um, from when they started to when they finished and they're graduating through this program. Is there anything more we need to do? So this is kind of like fact checking ourselves to make sure that this was something that we're, um, we're committed to and that we have any success in. Um, the University of Windsor is also supporting us from their office and open learning. They are absolutely in love with the fact that we've got micro-credentials and they've always said that the way Fishcast is doing it, so thank you to our community, is something that they want to highlight and herald as the, the blueprint for future types of um, micro-credential structures. And so they're throwing their support in for us to be able to digitize these badges. So trainees, all that work you're putting into, it means something, which means we're putting, we're making it official. We're accrediting it. The University of Windsor is giving it stamps so that you can take that to potential future employers and say, okay, I do have this broad understanding of these following topics. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those micro-credentials, but again, this is something that we gained a lot of support from, from the university. And the same Office for Open Learning also has um, given us some funding, so financial funding, to help us develop the FishCast micro-credential course on Indigenous Canada relations. We're still trying to find out the best way to use these funds so that it's not just a transactional use of the funds, but a much more meaningful way. We, again, I'd love to hear feedback on this from the wider community because, again, we don't want to do the, the standard, you know, pay someone to teach us the right way. Um, we want to break from that, break the mold and come up with potentially alternatives. So please use the chat, contact us after the fact. But again, we want to use these funds meaningful and in a meaningful way as well. So that's our program committee with a bit of an update. I'm going to switch to our remedic committee where the chairs are Dr. Fabria, Dr. Docker, Dr. Pitcher. So thank you so much, Kat, Margaret, and Trevor for this. But we also have it supported by Acacia, Katrina, and, and Kelly. And again, um, the remedic committee, they're responsible for overseeing the application materials, refining the application materials, assessing them. Again, sometimes we bring them back to the trainees saying, okay, can you have just a little bit of more information here? Because again, we wanna have this tailored, um, tailored kind of structure and pedagogy for each of the students that enter into FishCast. And so who are our trainees? Um, let, let's, let's look at a little bit of a breakdown. We, so Kendra was kind enough to break it down for us in undergrad, students, masters, PhD, and postdoc. And we broke it down by cohorts one, two, and three, just means year one, year two, year three. Um, we had a lot of undergrads starting. Some of them have actually moved to be master's students into FishCast, which is amazing. We now have master's students that are staying on and doing their PhD in FishCast. Again, incredible news to hear. Uh, you can see we are slower to take on and to support um, trainees in year one, and that's simply a reflection of our budget. NSERC in year one gives us a very tiny portion of our, our six-year budget. It starts to get bigger and bigger years two, three, four, five, and six, it shrinks again. So we're probably going to see that nice bell curve in terms of who we're taking on. But currently we have around 29 um, trainees in our program. We've had a total of 36 overall. And so we're doing really, really well numerically, we're hitting our targets. Again, this is something that NSERC wants to see, and it's something that we're definitely um, really proud, proud to show them. When we break down again who these cohorts are, we ask them what kind of career stream they're interested in. And you can see here on the left-hand side, most of our trainees are interested in pursuing policy, but policy mixed with applied research. So straddling that kind of um, divide and I, you know, integration amongst these resource sectors. So it's really, really interesting. And in terms of the research themes that they're doing within this policy and applied research, the majority of them are split between ecosystem and habitat assessment, you see here in green, as well as fish health and fitness. We've got um, fisheries, ecology and exploitation and fish culture coming in, again, equally shared amongst them. And so we do see kind of like a nice broad coverage of the different research that our trainees are currently um, conducting. So again, thank you, huge thank you to Remedic for overseeing this and um, guiding our students as they begin their journey. The next organizational structure we have are our operations committee. 
This is another way of saying our internship. So this is chaired by Dr. Brian Dixon and Professor Céline Odette. So I thank them both uh, for their hard work, as well as Connie, Christian, um, Eva, and Simone. And so this is where um, we have applications coming in. When students enter into FishCast, they have to have already an identified partner that they're going to be interning with. Because again, we want our students to hit the ground running. And it hasn't been an issue yet because again, it's our PIs who have these positive connections already to all of our partners. And so they oversee it. Um, the partners have to do an evaluation form midway through, as do our trainees. They have to do an evaluation form at the end, as do our trainees, because we want to make sure that it's, it's added value. We have some internship um, partners that invite our trainees to their meetings, that are talking to them about grants, that are going out into the field with them and, and doing more than just collecting data, but actually showing what it's like to work in these industries, in these communities, with these organizations. And so in terms of who they are currently, again, we have a whole list of partners, but here are the ones that are actively engaged with our trainees at the moment. So we can see here from, uh, from um, industry, we have from provincial governments, conservation authorities, federal governments and DFO, non-governmental organizations, some communities as well. And so again, across the different provinces. And so we can really see, um, I think like the, the, uh, the connections that we're starting to form that reflects this really great networking that we have amongst our fish cast community. Then we've got the curriculum community uh, committee, and it is huge, and it is huge for a good reason because this is where the meat is in terms of what fish cast can offer in terms of more of this added value, in terms of this professional development, not just hard skills, but soft skills. And so this is chaired by Dr. Nick Mandrak and Dr. Steve Cook. So I wanna thank Nick and Steve, as well as Courtney again, um, Dominique, Gislaine, Mark, Len, Katie, Dan, and Katrina, because again, when we're coming up with the seminars, the people we reach out to, when we're thinking of the ideas we should be um, teaching in our micro-credential courses, this is where the curriculum committee has really done their due diligence to reach out amongst themselves and to the wider community saying, what do you want your employees to know? What do you want them to come prepared with? We also listened when we got feedback, is micro-credentials the way to go? And we had some really positive feedback from those out in the working sector, in the community saying, yes, this is something that um, we wish we had access to. And it's something that we're, they were really, really supportive of. So we had, we put together um, wonderful FishCast seminar series in the springtime, both last year and earlier this year, where we had most of our PIs present, but we started to broaden and open it up. We had um, some of our partners present. So we had Dr. Mark Gaydon, who looked at the history and institutional relationships and conflict that led to, um, to the the wonderful creation of the GLFC, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. And we also had Dr. Derek Croker, who talked about science communication amongst resource practitioners. And we finished off with um, Dr. Valerie Burser, who talked about what makes the salmon still wild. So some really interesting, um, more, let's say, social science policy discussions. The YouTube channel, everything has been recorded. We had um, really great attendance. Um, uh, Kendra had been taking it. We had a, a, an average of 40. Uh, visitors per actually attending the talks. And then we have a bunch of views on the videos as well. Some of our seminars have actually been shown in classes saying, okay, you've got to watch this presentation because this is exactly what we want you to know. So that's really, really great impact. And we're so proud of that. And again, I'm so proud of all of our FishCast PIs and those who were involved in undertaking um, the micro-credentials. And again, I'm really proud of the trainees that said yes to them and took them. So we, and again, Dr. Barb Zielinski, thank you for overseeing us this summertime. We had a proposed field course that was part of our curriculum, but again, with COVID, we pivoted and our PIs really stepped up to the plate to take over and do it virtually. So instead of field research, we did field planning. So I want to thank everyone that was involved with that, um, as well as the one that happened earlier this year um, that was outside of the field planning. And again, um, we're going to be hearing one last micro-credential, which is the Fundamentals of Outreach and Science Communication, where we're going to be hearing from our trainees to see, okay, what did they do? So it's going to be extremely exciting. 
And of course, all the members that we have student reps on all of those committees and subcommittees, but the students have their own committee as well. And so I want to thank again, Albana, Christian, Ryan, Acacia, Gislaine, and Simone for being um, integrated into our kind of community, as well as taking messages to back and front, back and fro from the trainees and the admin team. It's really, really important to keep that kind of con um, flow of communication going. We listen and we'll, we'll, we'll readjust um, to be able to fit the needs and make sure that your experiences are as best quality as possible. And of course, we love to see photos of our students in action. So here's some fish cats at some conferences, not just trainees, but also the faculty members themselves has been amazing. We're going to see more photos from them in our photo contest towards the end, but just keep them coming. We just love to see your smiling faces, even if they're behind masks. We don't mind. Um, in terms of our commitment to our JEDI plus I initiative, so again, we have the Indigenous Scholarship. Um, we're going to try to open up our fish cast sem seminar series to, to more ways of knowing and other uh, viewpoints. We also had JEDI events. So at this year's uh, Canadian Conference for Fisheries Research and the Society of Canadian Limnologists, uh, we actually had our own workshop. This is the first workshop that was ever done at CCF of our, I think, live. I think Gary Pritchard had done one the year before. But this is the first networking one where it was called Diversity Networking, Creating Opportunities for All. So we had its fish cast training members. Um, it was co-run with Dr. Andrew Kirkwood from Ontario Tech University, as well as we had guest speakers, uh, Dr. Brooke Penan Luna and Yvonne Erzmendi. And again, it was, we, it was done hybrid, virtual, and in person. And we spent the, the day basically talking about what are some of the barriers to forming effective networking when we're um, early career scientists? How do we get in and, and you know, um, immerse ourselves into a network that's already established? How do we create our own new ones? What should we be on the lookout for? How can we overcome the barriers? So it was quite a success and we had really, really great feedback from that. And um, this is something we hope to continue. And again, change the themes of the workshops, but uh, we already have our student reps who are on board for this upcoming year in 2023 with the new um, Society of Canadian Aquatic Sciences. They're hosting another FishCast panel. So we're so proud of our FishCast trainees for doing that. Um, we followed up this diversity network by um, networking by celebrating International Women's Day by opening it up to the FishCast members who couldn't attend. And so this was headlined by Dr. Christine Magliger and Dr. Michael Godfrey at the University of Windsor. So thank you, Christine and Michael too. And Michael and Christine also held a, a coffee EDI kind of sit down for any of our trainees that wanted to discuss things that were not necessarily research oriented, specifically scientific, but research with potentially some work-life balance questions, EDI questions. And so it was a really great way to provide some mentorship and get feedback from our trainees as well. And it's something that, you know, if, that we hope and we're keen to continue. Um, but again, FishCast is not a FishCast without the trainees. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for you, if you weren't constantly engaged, if you didn't want to stay within FishCast, um, if you didn't feel like you were part of a community, if that's lacking, then we're not fish cats. That is not what we stand for. And so we thank our, our beautiful smiling trainees for, for being part of the community and for being an integral part of the community. Because again, we wouldn't be doing this if it weren't for you and if we didn't believe in your potential and, and your capability. And as always, I wanna thank my admin support team for keeping me on track, um, for steering me where I might go off the rails and um, to, to ground me in what's really important at the end of the day. So I wanna thank Kat, Katrina, Christine, and Kendra for that. Again, um, um, I'm speaking on their behalf, but it's really a collective effort. And so thank you for giving me opportunities to speak on your behalf. Okay. You know what, let's get to the fun stuff now. I think it's fun looking at numbers um, and budgets, but what's even more fun is to introduce to you our FishCast keynote speaker, which is Dr. Heidi Swanson. Um, Heidi's amazing. If those of you don't know her, please get to know her. Heidi has a passion, a strong passion for aquatic ecology. And what motivates her passion is the knowledge that environmental stewardship is at a crisis and it is an immediate concern. So she's so steeped and involved in that. Her actual research is her long-term interests lie in the interface of freshwater ecology, fish ecology and contaminant bioaccumulation. And so even though she's very strong in the natural sciences, um, for her, she places a lot of value and great value in developing positive 
interdisciplinary and collaborative relationships with other academics, with government researchers, with First Nations and Inuit communities, as well as industry. Um, Heidi is a de facto member of FishCast because she's co-supervising with one of our faculty members, uh, a trainee here in FishCast. And so um, when we asked her to, to be our keynote speaker, she really jumped at the chance and she said yes right away. And this showcases her commitment to, uh, again, bridging this, this gap in terms of uh, bringing disparate and not so disparate ways of knowing together and how co-production and co-development and co-engagement really is at the core of effective environmental stewardship. And to, just to showcase um, Heidi's success in that, she became the first inaugural Yaroslawski Chairholder in Sustainable Water Futures at, the, at Loria University. And this is a $4 million endowed research chair, and it specifically focuses on the impacts of climate change and the associated disturbances on northern aquatic ecosystem health. So Heidi's going to be leading, and she's already leading, an interdisciplinary research team integrating community input, including traditional knowledge, as well as multiple Indigenous partners in the Northwest Territories where she spends her time. In fact, this is how committed she is to all of these different in, um, ventures. Heidi is currently in the Northwest Territories. She cannot be here because of really poor cell phone service where she's working in the field. But that didn't stop Heidi. Heidi said, I'm going to record my talk. And I'm going to present, I hope you can present it on my behalf. She's going to try to get within cell range power at the end of her talk. If there's any questions, she can't guarantee it for which she apologizes profusely. But we're thinking if you can please put any questions in the chat. If you are new to FishCast and we don't have you on our list, if you can include your email address, because we're going to email Heidi those questions and she's going to be more than happy to respond because again, through her incredible commitment. So I am so proud to turn this over to Heidi's voice and to listen to her tell how stories guide the statistics, the understanding interactions that drive the fish mercury levels in northern lakes. And so without further ado, I'm going to stop presenting. I'm going to give control to Kendra. And if you have any questions in the meantime, I'll take a look at, look at the chat. So thank you, everybody. Merci tellement beaucoup. Miigwech. Giti miigwech, everyone. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to this talk. I'm so sorry that I can't be there live. I'm actually still in the field, um, but I'm very um, honored and happy to be invited by the organizers to show this talk with you. Stories guide the statistics, understanding interactions that drive fish mercury levels in Northern Lakes. My name is Heidi Swanson. Uh, I was a professor at University of Waterloo for about nine years. And then on July 1st, transitioned over to Wilfrid Laurier University as the Jaroslawski Chair in Sustainable Water Futures. I'm speaking to you today from Chief Draghi's territory, um, land that has been home to the Yellow Knives Dene since time immemorial. And the project that I'm going to be focusing on today has been, I've just been so privileged to be a part of, work with several First Nations and Dejo First Nations on Dene Day. I would like to first thank Dejo First Nations, as well as all of the individual nations that uh, we've worked with over the years, including Kritlikwe, Kagitu, Jean Marie River, Digagoti, Pedziki, and Samba K. Um, we've been funded by a number of amazing sources. Um, this isn't a direct FishCast project, but I see the objectives as being very complementary with those of FishCast. I would especially like to thank George Lowe and Mike Lowe, the coordinators of Dito ARAM the Aboriginal Aquatic Resources and Oceans Management Program, who invited us onto this project um, and have invited me into their homes and their families, as well as um, I would have a whole bunch of co-authors to thank here, but I would really like to highlight Dr. Mehdi Nafuni Akdam, a newly minted uh, doctor who received his, um, or defended his PhD, sorry, in, in just June 22, 2022 here. And I'm going to be highlighting some of Mehdi's work during this talk. So back in 2013, um, several of the nations within Dato First Nations participated in a return to country food workshop. And this was part of a series of workshops that were held in, over uh, several years. And during this workshop, it was noted that uh, rates of food insecurity were high and that the consumption of traditional foods was uneven among generations, with older generations consuming more, and then a general decline in traditional food consumption. And, Part of this conversation was that, was that some people were scared to eat fish because of mercury, 
and because of site-specific consumption advisory. So on the right here, you can see a picture of um, a typical sign from the Government of Northwest Territories Health and Social Services. This sign is actually at Ikali Lake, one of the steady lakes in the region. And what these are is when the government has some data on fish murky levels, if they exceed or are above a certain threshold, there will be advisories listed for certain species and sizes of fish, and then recommended serving sizes and frequency of consumption are recommended for different demographics, including pregnant people and children, as well as um, other demographics. The problem is that these advisories, um, we're working on this, like advisories are a really compl complicated topic. And in this case, we're only considering the risks of consuming fish and not also the benefits, which include the provision of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, as well as selenium. And then importantly, the cultural well-being and community well-being that comes from harvesting fish on traditional land. And so I'm going to come back to that a little bit later in the talk about risks and benefits. But out of these workshops also sprang a number of questions from communities that um, Mike and George Lowe approached me about for help. So communities wanted to figure out why some lakes have high fish mercury and other lakes have low fish mercury. Um, how will climate change and resource development affect fish mercury levels? And in lakes where we have high fish mercury, is there anything that we can actually do about it? And so my work in this project over the last 10 years has been to really center these community questions, um, work with folks to try to um, address them as fulsomely as possible, while also supporting um, HQP and getting their MSc and PhD degrees. And sometimes when we're trying to marry community priorities with the requirements of a thesis, you know, MSc or PhD program, there can be some disjuncts, like they're not completely overlapping all of the time. So I see that as an important part of my work is, is marrying these two um, priorities. The community parties come first, um, and then how do we layer on the training and build on those community parties to come up with MSc and PhD theses? And how do we do this in a community context where there's a lot of flexibility and adaptability and changes that are required year to year and sometimes even day to day? Um, and I'm happy to engage with folks you know, by email or informal talks afterwards if they're interested in this. So for people who don't know a ton about mercury, there are both natural and anthropogenic sources of mercury to the atmosphere. So um, a lot of mercury would be tied up in the lithosphere, so in rocks, but it can be released into the atmosphere via volcanoes as shown in this top picture or via anthropogenic activities, including burning of fossil fuels, especially coal, and also artisanal and small scale gold mining is actually a huge source of mercury to the atmosphere right now. It's a problem when it's in the atmosphere because it can be transported long distances from the source. So mercury can be resident in the atmosphere for six to nine months, which means that mercury that is released from an anthropogenic activity in Idaho or Alberta or Mexico, that mercury can make it to the subarctic and Arctic. Um, once it's deposited onto the landscape, the inorganic form of mercury that was present in the atmosphere can be converted to an organic form of mercury called methylmercury. And methylmercury can bioaccumulate and biomagnify in organisms and food webs. And globally, consumption of fish is the largest source of mercury exposure. So the mercury accumulates and biomagnifies in aquatic food webs in lakes and rivers. We're looking at lakes in this project. Um, globally, eating fish is your most important source of exposure to mercury. And this is especially important where fish are consumed frequently and in high abundance, and this is often true in northern indigenous communities. So that's why we really want to look at this as a topic of importance. So mercury is also um, infuriatingly, but also super interestingly, very biogeochemically complex. So there's a lot of interrelated cycles that govern how much mercury will build up in a fish, including water chemistry, temperature, dissolved organic carbon, pH, oxygen levels, nutrient concentrations, chlorophyll A concentrations, clarity, depth, um, lots of characteristics about the fish themselves, their age, their size, their growth rate, their trophic ecology as indicated by DEL15 and then DEL13C often, the food web structure, the community composition of both benthic invertebrates, well, benthic invertebrates and zooplankton and fish in the lake will affect mercury bioaccumulation. So, Figuring all these things out and then which processes are dominating the variation 
is um, a really interesting and tricky prospect and it requires whole ecosystem work. So what have we done and what do we do? We have built off foundational community questions and we refine the questions and approaches each year and especially every three years when we revisit funding cycles. And this is done through meetings um, that are held every November to February in the community. The lakes are selected by communities. Um, we've sampled 15 so far that represent four ecoregions spread across the 70,000 kilometer squared study area. And all the sampling is performed by a joint researcher and Indigenous guardian team. So I'm at all the camps and then one to two students and then guardians from Dato Aram, from Dato KOD, um, and from the new Adeji protected area, so the Adeji guardians. We all work together on the land to fulfill um, complementary priorities and then also work together basically to build camps and to get everything done in about seven to 10 days per lake per year. Um, so to give you an idea of where we're talking about this square here, we're in the subarctic southwesternish portion of the NWT, this um, or what is now called the NWT, this um, yellowish sort of shape is indicating the Horn Plateau, really topographically and scientifically interesting area, as well as um, sort of the center, not the full extent of, but the new Adeji protected area, which is an indigenous protected area. So what if we looked at, um, we've looked at fish mercury levels, also at nutrient levels, I'm going to mention briefly at the end, including omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, as well as selenium, trophic ecology, so del 15 and del 13 b age, size, weight, and condition, lake water mercury and chemistry, sediment mercury and chemistry, benthic inverts. More recently, we've been um, adding some geospatial analyses to look at catchments, the size and depth of lakes. Sometimes we have to model these because the lakes are quite big. <laughs> And then the interaction of all these factors, which is really um, what Mehdi undertook so productively during his doctoral research. Um, it does require a lot of logistics and upfront work. So the top picture here is um, when we were staging for our first fly in camp this year. So getting everything ready for the float plane. Um, and then we fly in. And this is kind of what camp looks like. So we fish, we gather invertebrates, we gather zooplankton, we gather water things are processed and preserved in camp. Um, there's a lot of time uh, building camp at the beginning, which I'll talk about in just a minute, um, and then working together to make things happen. And sometimes things are pretty comedic. So in this lower right corner was us transporting an outhouse from a camp across the lake to where we were camping because a float plane couldn't get in. Um, this actually, um, the center photo, oh, sorry, here, is the group shot from Balmer Lake, which was our second camp this August 2022 in the new Adeji protected area. And uh, this was a great camp and the first uh, research excursion into since Adeji has become formalized. So there's been research ongoing for several years. The top left is Elsie teaching me how to make dry fish. So um, after fish are processed for science, um, in each camp we ask um, what would folks like done with the leftover fish. Sometimes we make dry fish, sometimes folks would like it slabbed for dogs, sometimes we smoke it, sometimes we fillet and debone it, and then it goes back to the community. Um, Stephen in the middle here is operating um, some instrumentation to do bathymetry, and then at the bottom left um, we're working to uh, look at stomach contents and otoliths uh, with the guardians from Pedziki. So um, when we're on the land, a lot of other activities are done. So in the middle top here, um, in Balmer, just a couple of weeks ago, the elders had asked, because they can't get on the land very often anymore, they had asked us to bring back water from the lake to make tea, because um, they like it so much better than drinking water in town, Labrador tea, uh, cranberries, and uh, rat root, which we did. Um, the guardians are often also harvesting for the community, so these foods are processed. And then there's a lot of what we call infrastructure building. So you can see on the top right here, this was our camp at Blackwater Lake and um, the Guardians did an incredible job building tables and chairs. And this was my favorite throne of all time. This was Balmer Lake just a couple of weeks ago. Um, best outhouse construction ever. We also brushed the camp to make it easier for other folks that want to do on the land activities. So taking down brush for bugs, but also um, for bear sighting. So I'm going to jump now into some of the results. And these are just snapshots. They're not 
um, always the most up to date results that kind of convey the, the overall message just because I don't have data back from uh, this last season. So what we have found is that over the course of the study, all lake whitefish have low mercury. And so you'll see here that I've standardized to a given size. This is 450 millimeters for lake whitefish. And we've just got size adjusted mercury concentration in PPM wet on the y-axis. Basically, wherever we look, whitefish have very low mercury concentrations. And they also have um, high, relatively high omega-3 fatty acid concentrations. So these are a really healthy fish to eat. This red line at 0.5, this represents Health Canada's guideline for retail sale. So if you want to sell a fish in Canada, it needs to be below this guideline for mercury. This guideline is not meant to be applied to subsistence or um, wild caught fish harvested um, for Indigenous communities. We are using it here as a reference line. So basically, from a risk communication standpoint, this is a great story. If we want to go back to that return to country food workshop and um, you know, communicate the knowledge out. It's basically, we caught lake whitefish in every single lake and in every single lake, the mercury levels are low and the fatty acid levels are high. So these are a great nutritious source um, of traditional food. Walleye on the other hand have more variable mercury concentration. So here we've got size adjusted mercury on the Y axis. Um, again, adjusted to 450 millimeters. We do the size adjustment because otherwise one lake might have higher mercury or look like it has higher mercury than another just because the fish are bigger. So we need to make sure we're comparing apples to apples here. So we can see variability here and some of the lakes have mercury concentrations that exceed uh, the retail sale guideline. Same for Northern Pike. And then we really honed in on Northern Pike um, in terms of elucidating mechanisms of among lake variability. This is because we caught Northern Pike in every lake and because they tend to have some of the higher mercury concentrations. Pike and walleye have higher mercury concentrations than whitefish because they feed at a higher trophic level. They are um, piscivorous as opposed to um, like whitefish, which are benthivorous for the most part. So when I first started trying to relate everything to everything, <laughs> as we do, so relate the mercury concentrations in pike to their trophic ecology, to um, their life history, to habitat use, to water chemistry, I came up with this, what I thought was a great story to begin with. So here we've got this dashed red line at again at 0.5 ppm wet, it's just been transformed for the log scale. So these are log mercury concentrations on the y axis. And every one of these symbols indicates a lake. So what we can see here is that I regress this against cell 13c. Um, cell 13 c's are indicator usually of habitat use. So fish that are feeding um, over here, there's a, a less depleted signature are thought to be feeding in more littoral or nearshore environments. And fish with more depleted delta 13 c signatures are thought to be feeding on more um, pelagic um, prey in more offshore environments. So what I interpreted this graph to mean was that um, in lakes where fish were feeding closer to shore, they had lower mercury concentrations. And when they were feeding further offshore, they had higher mercury concentrations. And this actually made some sense because I found that these delta 13 c signatures were related to sucky depth of that particular lake or water clarity, which was then related to force covering the catchment. So that catchments that were more forested, the water was clearer, we had um, greater sucky depth, and then the fish were feeding more offshore. And um, when they were feeding more offshore, they grew more slowly. And when fish grow more slowly, they have higher mercury accumulation. So I thought this was super cool. And I also thought, hey, this really aligns with our whole goal of trying to link catchments to water to fish in a whole ecosystem um, framework and in a way that reflects um, the knowledge that has been shared with us um, by the guardians. So we went to do our community engagement tour that year. It was probably 2016 or 17 and I was all excited. And guardians and elders said, Heidi, that's not it. It's not where the fish are. We always catch them near shore. So that can't be it. It's the land and the fish and the water color, and you're seeing some of that, but that's changing the fish. So you're missing a piece. So that basically sent us back to the drawing board. And this takes us back to the title of the talk, which is Stories, Guides, and Statistics. So basically, I was seeing something and interpreting it in a certain way, but that did not match the observations of the people who are actually catching the fish. So let's start again. And I hate showing PCA. Um, in presentations because they're so difficult to interpret. But basically, 
what I wanted to kind of illustrate here was the juxtaposition between the stories and then the statistics. So we went back, started again, and this is Mehdi's work. I will not take um, credit for this. This work of his was published in 2021 in Aquatic Sciences. And basically we took all of the catchment and water chemistry data and we came up with these indicators of catchment influence. So how influenced is a lake by its catchment? When the lake was more influenced by its catchment, that is it's driven more by alloxanus or terrestrial dissolved or inorganic carbon, or as we interpreted it, pike were growing slower. So when we have growth on the y-axis and we have our inferred catchment influence from water chemistry and catchment attributes on the x-axis, each one of these dots is a lake and 75% of the among lake variation in pike growth was driven by this inferred catchment influence. These are basically PC scores. So why is this and how did this play into what I had seen before? Basically, um, I had interpreted Del 13 to be, you know, not the traditional lakes, there's many, many different ways to interpret DEL-13C and it is very nuanced, but I automatically in my head associate DEL-13C with littoral versus offshore feeding, but also DEL-13C also tracks sources of dissolved inorganic carbon. Dissolved inorganic carbon from the terrestrial environment has a more negative signature than dissolved inorganic carbon from the nearshore environment. So that relationship I saw was real, I just interpreted it incorrectly. So instead of, um, fish having higher mercury because they were feeding more offshore, they had higher mercury because their catchments in those lakes were different than in lakes where, where the northern pike were growing more quickly. And this, there's several implications for effects of climate change and resource development. So um, Mehdi kind of took this and did this really eloquent and elegant job of um, developing a piecewise structural equation model from a giant meta model. So all of the factors like could affect all of the things <laughs> leading to fish mercury. And what we found here was that um, the 80, more than 80% of the among lake variation in northern pike mercury could be explained by two proximate variables, fish growth, which we just talked about, so fish that grow more slowly have higher mercury concentrations and vice versa, and mercury at the bottom of the food web, so methylmercury and benthic invertebrates. And these two proximate variables were driven by a series of direct and indirect effects of ultimate catchment factors, so the lake to catchment area, so basically how large the catchment is relative to the size of the lake, as well as the forest cover in the lake, whether it was deciduous, um, mixed wood, or more coniferous. These catchment factors affect dissolved organic carbon and are, um, the amount of terrestrial carbon getting to the lake, sediment mercury, um, water methyl mercury, and these drove food web, food web mercury as well as fish growth. So we have this interaction among catchment factors, lake factors, and fish factors that makes sense um, and also is aligned with what we are hearing from folks who are actually harvesting the fish, which is that the color of the lakes, the fish growth, so how fast they are or how fast they are perceived to be growing really depends on the color of the lakes, which is what we see here, DOC fish growth. So um, when translated into plain language, we can say that mercury in northern pike is higher when the area around the lake is larger, while the lake itself is smaller. When the lake's at a lower elevation and has a steep slope with mixed forest around it, and when there's more disturbance, including both fire and permafrost, although I did not show those results today. These catchment characteristics lead to more tea-colored water, so that's higher DOC, and then higher mercury in both water and sediment which in turn lead to um, prey that have higher methylmercury concentrations and slower growth. Um, and then when um, catchments are smaller relative to the lake size, they're at a higher elevation, such as in Edzaji. There's mostly shelled on grasslands around the lakes. The water is clearer, the mercury is lower in water and sediment, the pike grow faster, the prey have lower methylmercury, and then we have lower mercury in northern pike. Um, we've linked this work to food security and human health through collaborators in School of Public Health and Health Systems at University of Waterloo, including Dr. Kelly Skinner and Dr. Brian Laird. So not only have we looked at the fish, but we've looked at the humans. So here's the other thing. If you have these site-specific consumption advisories, um, but people weren't eating much fish in the first place, is there really a risk? And then what's the mental health risk, right, from scaring people? 
So there was a human biomonitoring study designed um, by the human health team to look at mercury levels in blood and urine in folks in the Daycho and link it to the frequency of fish consumption, as well as the types of fish that they were consuming and in which lakes. We also looked at the associations between omega-3 fatty acids, selenium, and mercury. Um, and our goal is to inform risk benefit assessment. So not looking, only looking at the risks of consuming fish, but also the benefits. Um, this is just an illustration on the right of sort of a standard poster that we've co-developed to uh, communicate the results each year back to communities. And it also highlights um, an answer to the last question that the communities posed, which is, if there is high fish mercury, can we do anything about it? So on Sanguiz Lake, the mercury concentrations in Northern Pike are really quite high. And so there's several things that you can actually do to mitigate high fish mercury. Um, you can lime the lake, you can cap lake sediments. Um, there's even been intensive burning of catchments that folks have done to try to mitigate very high mercury. The other thing that you can do is intensive fishing. So if you intensively fish a population and you decrease the density of individuals in that population, the individuals that are left are gonna grow more quickly because there's less competition. And when they grow more quickly, they have lower mercury. And this was the community driven response to the Sanguis Lake result. So the community undertook an intensive fishing project to try to drive down these fish mercury levels. Um, to date, we haven't been able to take out enough biomass to have as yet a measurable impact um, on the mercury levels, but there have been other measurable impacts. So um, a new camp has been built. People are visiting the lake more frequently. Harvest has increased. And, this approach really aligned with the knowledge that was shared from guardians, elders, and leadership, including the chief, where when we presented these results at first, um, they said, hey, Heidi, the thing is, there used to be an elder on this lake that was responsible for fishing, um, and he has passed away, and nobody's taken over the fishery, and since then, we've noticed there are more fish, and they're all the same size. So basically, we took you know, human stewardship out of that ecosystem. The fish population increased, and now we have or we, maybe we had it before, but we know currently we have a mercury problem. Can we use harvest to bring this down? Um, so that project is ongoing and community led through Jean Marie River First Nation. Going forward, we can't predict the effects of change um, without understanding how the ecosystem components are connected, which is really what we were trying to do in this study, including the humans, um, which is the part that natural scientists, we often want to take out. And I know me like, I went into natural science because I'm not super great with humans, <laughs> um, but we really do have to consider ourselves in the ecosystems because we are a part of them. Results from a large modeling exercise has indicated we need to refine our understanding of catchment water fish health interactions, including human health. And we want to expand the study areas um, based on community priorities, the generalizability um, and the continuing knowledge translation to communities and decision makers. And then also um, taking part in opportunistic research opportunities. So when we're in camp, folks will ask, um, what happens if we smoke the fish or cook the fish? Or what happens if we eat two different kinds of fish together? Um, does that affect how much mercury makes it into our system? And so we are trying to address uh, some of these community questions as well as they evolve. I wanted to reflect just for a moment um, on what I've learned from stories. And so over the last 10 years in this project, I've learned that community priorities do come first. And sometimes this is difficult. You know, sometimes you've spent months and months planning and you have a student really relying on these data and it doesn't, your priorities are not as important as the communities that can be mental health crises, suicides, elder deaths, all of these things. Um, can and will affect your research. And so as a supervisor, I've learned it's as hard as that can be, um, especially when you're younger and haven't kind of lived through it and, and seen that it always works out in the end, no matter what, it's important for me to have backup plans for the student. What projects um, can they tackle that are related on a similar subject area that we can take on if the conditions in the community change and they can't support that project that year after all. Maybe they're back the next year, but obviously the students want to progress through their masters. Stories and statistics. Um, I think I'm trying to learn slowly how to think differently. I think one thing I've realized in being trained as a natural scientist in Western science context is that I was trained to think hierarchically and I was trained to think defensively. 
And I think a lot about words, like we say thesis defense and proposal defense. And I think that's problematic, but then also we conflate defense of our work from defense of ourselves. So can we let that go? Can I let that go? You know, can I be more open-minded? Am I okay with being wrong most of the time, <laughs> at least a little bit, you know? Um, and I think that's been a really important part of the process. And then letting go of this hierarchy of chain of being, you know, where we've got a, you know, a God or whatever above, and then humans and then animals and then plants, letting all of that go um, and learning to look at the world in a different way. And I've learned that through stories that have been shared with me and taught to me, but that's actually informed how I do statistics <laughs> in a very Western framework. Um, I need to understand that my ability to listen has been shaped and altered by my training as a scientist, as I just talked about defensiveness as an example. But also another example is objectivity. What does that mean? Am I really objective? Are any of us really objective? Are we trying to be unbiased? What if we conjugate the word objective to object are the fish and the ecosystems and the people that we study then objects this then goes back to the hierarchy and how we see ourselves in the world um, i needed to learn that i'm not entitled to teaching so in a western educational context i was used to asking very direct questions that can be very rude in many cultures and so I now know that I'm not entitled to have answers. Um, answers will come to me when they will come to me and they'll be given when it's appropriate. Um, what systems and structures that are enmeshed and embedded with science and academia need to be dismantled for decolonization and reconciliation? Um, I think about this a lot, but I think about my own role in it as an individual. Um, what can I do tangibly? Is it a reflection today? Is it um, thinking about how I can change the way I think, thinking about the way that I mentor students, the way that I communicate. And then I also think a lot about, based on the stories that have been shared with me, humanity. And I feel that sometimes scientific training really can beat the humanity out of us. And we need to put on these masks and show up to work and show up to talks and show up to defenses with this, this mask on. And it strips us of our humanity. And I think, really to the detriment of the quality of our science. So um, where are we going to go with that in the future? And with that, I would like to see a huge masicho to all of my teachers um, and all of the folks who have shared their wisdom with me. And thank you so much again for the invitation and for your attention. Um, and I hope you have a really great rest of your session. Fantastic. What an amazing talk. Um, unfortunately, Heidi couldn't be here. We couldn't get a hold of her. I can't see her on the chat, if any of you can. Um, but I know I certainly have some questions for Heidi. And if you want, put them in the chat as well. And again, we can open up a discussion. We, um, potentially, we don't necessarily need Heidi, but if anyone wants to contribute any of their own um, insights and experiences, please go right ahead. Anyone have any similar experiences, ways of looking at statistics? Steve, yeah. Hi, Steve. Hey, how's everybody doing? Good to see all of you. Uh, yeah, that was a fantastic talk. Um, I think the, uh, the, the suggestion that professors as well as mentees, this idea that you need to have backup plans. I'm seeing it more and more also because of curveballs with biodiversity and climate change. So uh, we've had floods, we've had we've had projects destroyed by floods, by droughts, uh, by permits being revoked because of low population sizes with some of the salmon runs, which is entirely justifiable. You know, I don't want to study anything to death. And uh, um, but that's, I, I think, having those discussions on the front end and not being, a, not having it be just 
the professor planning for that, but building that into how we train the next generation of students, because I think there's going to be more and more of that. So it's it's kind of going with the flow, being creative, thinking outside the box, being resilient and, uh, you know, realizing at the end of the day that thesis might or almost certainly will look a little bit different than what the original plan was, and that's OK. Yeah, thanks a lot, Steve, for that, too. And of all the trainees that had to go through COVID, you know about pivoting in terms of what works and what doesn't work. And um, I think one thing that we say to most of our trainees is I can guarantee you one thing in science is that your project, the way you know it right now, is not going to be the same by the end of it. Gar that's my only guarantee, that and hopefully funding, but that is definitely it. Um, Katie, we'd love to hear your thoughts, too. Yeah, hi. Just at the at the end of that, I it struck me as a, a conversation I just had with one of my technicians today. She said, I, I spent all day working in this program, but I didn't accomplish anything. And so that conversation that we had of, you know, you did accomplish something. You, you spent your whole day thinking and that it's, you know, we, we talked a little bit about imposter syndrome and, and that sort of thing. And that at the end of the day, when you're doing a science job or you're in grad school, you might not have something tangible at the end of the day that says this is the thing I accomplished today. But the thing you accomplished today is that you eliminated some some things that maybe aren't the right process to go, you know, in one direction. So just, you know, knowing same thing, you know, you're pivoting, you're still learning. And it's that idea that, you know, we don't necessarily get to check things off at the end of the day. So, and that was a conversation we just had today. Wow. Well, and how was the person at the end? Do you think they understood a little bit more? Yeah, for sure. You know, and, and I think just that um, I think for, for, you know, for us as as mentors and supervisors, being able to have those conversations with our with our mentees and with our students and be able to say, like, you're not alone. We went through this. We had imposter syndrome. We don't always accomplish something at the end of the day. And that's OK. And, and I think that's a really important conversation to to have. And yeah, I think she felt a little bit better about it. That's great, Katie. Yeah. And so true. I also like Tidy's um, messages on becoming defensive. Um, and like, again, like who doesn't get offended when um, basically we're told we're not doing something right. When you, when you have the best of intentions and yet know that's still a learning, right? You, you know what you know, but you don't know everything. And so that was a really good check. And I was appreciative that Heidi was open about that and was like exposed herself to, to saying, yeah, I, I screw up. I made mistakes. I am not. It, if I want to learn something, that's what, that when they're ready to teach me. And it's something that in our role sometimes as mentors, it's like we need to have all the answers. We need to have them right away. We need to have a backup plan when um, sometimes it doesn't work out. And so there's that kind of fear, I think, of going with the flow, which is amazing, but also going, okay, I need, I need to break, I need to have something to fall back on. And sometimes, like Heidi said, you'll you have to wait and it'll come to you. She said, it will work out. It will all work out. So I really, really appreciated um, that message that she gave. Anybody else want to share anything or comment on it? Um, I have a few thoughts, if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, of course, yes, go ahead. It's funny, this morning I was actually on a phone call with Steve, my supervisor, and there's this side project I've had for like two years, and it's like every time I think I make headway, it didn't go the way I thought it would, and then I circle back, and we're back to the drawing board, and it's just like that continuous learning process and um, getting humbled, basically, and um, I think the only way that I've been able to like you know, pick myself up every couple of months and like try again over this like two years is because like of a support system and communicating and getting over that imposter, imposter syndrome and not feeling like embarrassed or silly when I'm like, okay, I tried this thing and again, it didn't work. Like I'm not stupid. You know, my co-supervisors are stumped. I'm stumped. Some of like my colleagues in the lab are stumped. Like we're just all collectively stumped and talking about it and trying again and you know maybe it takes time and so many different like efforts to step back and be like wait a second we've been doing this and we've put our head down and we've been doing this 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 what if 
we pull back for a second, look at it with fresh eyes. And I mean, specifically to my project, it's like I want to analyze it in this way. But then when I'm trying to make a figure or like visualize it, it's not conducive to the way I analyzed it. And Steve and I just discussed this morning, maybe those two things can be different. The way you present your results doesn't have to be the exact way that you were like coding in R and like how you made your model. Like you can think outside of the box and be like, OK, how is my audience going to interpret this versus like, how did I write up my methodology? And so, you know, like two years later, we're just like, oh, yeah, huh? What if we did that? <laughs> and so just constantly like talking to people and not feeling embarrassed and being like, yep, that didn't work out again is like how I've been surviving this project for the last two years. <laughs> no, and that's amazing. And it speaks to the fortitude of just continuing. And you know, even if you're the only one who doesn't understand, it means, okay, there's another method you need to be taught it, maybe another way of learning. And I think at the end of the day, I love when you come to your defense, and I know defense, right? It's another word that Heidi um, put up, but it tells, I love defenses where people ask, tell your story. How did it start? How did it end? And I think by that reflection, you can learn, okay, this is how I started. This is what we went through. And I think the storytelling even comes out in the figures like you just mentioned. You know, no matter how, what you coded in R and the statistical results you present, what you actually want to tell your audience is a story. And what's the best way to tell your story? And so that's, I think, those are the key take-home messages as well. You know, like things aren't going to work out. Um, imposter syndrome is real. People, you know, do suffer from it. But you're learning as you go along. You're learning from your setbacks. It might not feel like it, but you're you're coming away, I think, with more to your toolbox. And I'm saying that specifically because I know you work on your toolbox assessments, Jess. So, um, but I think at the end of the day, I think it's more important to tell a story than have results that are beautiful and clean. So, thank you for sharing. That's true. That's good. And good luck on that side project. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Anybody else want to share any stories? I think I want to actually poll. Let's poll our audience then in terms of have any of you come up against um, projects that just didn't work out or that you struggled with and you ended up doing something completely different and, you know, because you had to change. I'm, just, I'm going to raise my hand. That's happened to me. Yeah, right? Definitely. It's much, much more common. I think it's universal. And if I may be bold to use a word that some people don't like, I would say it's ubiquitous um, in terms of that. Yeah, I, exactly. It does kind of describe most field ecology and sometimes even lab-based uh, most field ecology projects. Exactly. I would agree too. Um, Katie also said storytelling is super important, especially when you leave academia. Yeah, I agree. And Céline said, I often see my research job as a long-term learning process. Right, Céline? We'll see. It happens. And I'm learning and I'm correcting and my behaviors and my responses to things all the time. Um, Nick, Nicola, you said, I think that describes most field ecology projects. And Kat, you said Masi Cho. Um, I just wanted to extend deep gratitude and appreciation for Heidi's vulnerability, humility, which makes the science she shared today all the more impactful. Likewise, so much appreciation for all the teachers and the human and non-human beings. Exactly. I have some, I do have some raised hands, but they, are, are they legacy raised hands when I asked you to raise your hands? If not, Morgan, would you like to um, add anything? Oh, what? Okay, Steve, I still see your raised hand. Oh. That's it. <laughs> I scared everyone into silence. Um, if there anything else, because if not, we can take a sh uh, we can take a break. As so I'm looking at our agenda right now, so hold on, I'll get it up. We can take a break until 1:40 p.m. So if you need so in 20 minutes, we'll come back. So you do a stretch break because you've been sitting for a while, have something to eat, something to drink, stay hydrated, and we can't wait to see you back in about 20 minutes. And until then, um, à la prochaine, bientôt, à bientôt, pas ma pie. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>